So now we've discussed and understand how a damped harmonic oscillator moves. But there's one final class of oscillator that we have to discuss, and that is a driven harmonic oscillator. So these are damped harmonic oscillators which have an external oscillating driving force applied to them that forces the system to move. So first of all, let's start with applying Newton's second law to a system like this and trying to solve the equation, equation of motion that we get. So here we have the same system we've seen before. We've got a mass M on the end of a spring. We've got a force due to Hooke's law that's proportional to the extension. We've got a force that damps the system that's proportional and opposite to the velocity. And now we have this new oscillating force that oscillates with a frequency omega. So what we're going to do is we're going to do Newton's second law and we're going to go the positive direction as being right, um, just as we've done before. And when we do this, we're now, of course, we've got force is equal to mass times acceleration, and now we've got three forces. First of all, we've got minus kx, because remember that acts in the opposite direction to our definition for positive. We've got minus b times x dot, which again acts in the opposite direction. And then we have plus f naught times the cosine of omega t. And those are our three forces, but this one is positive because of the way we've uh, defined the convention here. And this, of course, is equal to m times x double dot. So now we can rearrange this just as we've done before, and we get a differential equation that's our equation of motion. So here we have x double dot, um, and then we're going to have plus b over m times x dot, and then we're going to have plus k over m times x, and this is going to be equal to, and then we've got f naught, and then it's divided by m times the cosine of omega times t. So, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the solutions that are a long time, you know, the motion of the system a long time after it's been set in motion. So we want the what we're going to call the steady state solution. And if we look at this, we can see that we've got a cosine of omega t. And omega here, remember, is the frequency of the driving force. It's not the frequency of any part of the system. It's the frequency of the external force that's applied to the system. So if we look at this, we've got a double, uh, we've got a double differential here, a first order differential here, and we've got x. Remember, x is a function of time, and this has to be equal to a cosine of omega t. So we're going to want something that oscillates with a frequency of omega. Otherwise, you know, because that will give us a cosine omega t here, it'll give us a cosine omega t here, but we're going to end up with a sine here because it's a first order differential. So we can't just use cosine of omega t because that isn't going to work. We're going to have a sine term here. So what we're going to try as a solution is that x of t here is going to be equal to and then we're going to have some amplitude a times the cosine and now we're going to have omega t and then to make the signs work out it doesn't make any difference we're going to have minus a constant phi and we could put plus in here and then we just get the signs flipped it doesn't make any difference but this is the solution that we are going to try in our equation of motion here so let's try that so here's our expression that we're going to try for x, our solution that we're going to attempt. When we differentiate it, the cosine goes to sine, and we get an omega here, and of course we get a minus sign because there's a cosine goes to, to minus sine. Um, when we differentiate it again, our sine goes to cosine, and we get another factor of omega here, so it becomes omega squared. So these are the values that we want to uh, take and substitute into our equation of motion that we've written out here. But before we do that, let's rewrite this. If we look at this side of the equation, this is exactly what we had for the damped harmonic oscillator. So we can rewrite this in terms of the damping ratio and the natural frequency of the system. And when we do that, we're going to end up with x double dot plus 2 uh, zeta omega naught uh, times x dot, 
And then here, this is just going to be omega naught squared times x is equal to f naught over m times the cosine of omega t. So this is just rewriting this in terms of zeta, the damping ratio, and the natural frequency omega naught. So now we're going to substitute these values into this equation here. So when we do this, we're going to end up with minus omega squared a times the cosine of omega t minus phi. So that's our x double dot term. Then we're going to have 2 zeta omega naught times this. So this is going to be minus 2 zeta omega naught times omega um, and then a sine and then omega t minus phi. And then finally here, we're going to have plus omega naught squared times a cos omega t minus phi. And then this, of course, is just equal to our f naught over m times the cosine of omega t. Now, the algebra now is getting a bit hairy. What we need to do next is we need to rewrite this side of the equation here in terms of just omega t. So we need to look at our trig um, identities to split the co these cosine and sine terms up. Okay, so here are our two uh, uh, trig identities, and these are going to allow us um, to split up the terms that we have. So here is our differential equation. I've written it out uh, one term above the other so that it's going to be easier uh, to see what's going on here. If we take this first term here, it's cosine of omega t minus phi. And so this cosine of, of a minus b is just the cosine of a times the cosine of b plus the sine of a times the sine of b. And so this term here is going to be equal to minus omega squared a times cosine of omega t cosine of phi. And then we're going to have another uh, minus sign here because it's plus here, plus times minus is minus. So this is going to be, again, omega squared a. And now we're going to have the sine of omega t and then the sine of phi. So that's our first term converted. Our second term here, while well, this is minus 2 zeta uh, omega naught times omega uh, times a. And then we have sine omega t minus phi. And so our sine addition rules will give us sine omega t times the cosine of phi. And then we're going to have the second term. Well, here we're going to minus a sign in front of it. So minus times a minus gives us a plus. So this is going to be plus. And then it's going to be 2 zeta omega naught omega a. Um, and this time now times the cosine of omega t times the sine of phi. And then this last term here, um, we have omega naught squared times a. So this is omega naught squared a. And then it's the cosine of omega t minus phi. So this becomes cosine of omega t times the cosine of phi. And then it's plus and a plus. So again, plus and then omega naught squared a. And then this is going to be sine omega t and then sine phi. So we've got this now hugely long expression. So let's tidy this up and then go about how we're going to figure out how we're going to solve this. So here we can see the terms that we've got, this horrendous expression with all these separate terms. But if we look at these terms, we can see a little bit of a pattern. Here we've got a cosine omega t. Here we've got a cosine omega t. Here we have a cosine omega t. And then on this side, we have a cosine omega t. And similarly, we can look at the sine. We can see that we have sine omega t here, sine omega t here, and sine omega t here. And these are the only terms which have a dependence on the time t. And t is a variable. And what that means is we can choose our value of t to be whatever we want. We can look at the system at any time, and this had better be true because it's the equation of motion describing the system. So this has to be true for any value of t. 
But if we look down here at this plot and we look at how sine and cosine vary depending on the value of omega t that we're looking at, we can see that here, you know, cosine decreases and sine is increasing. In this region here, we have both of them decreasing and we can pick the different regions and we can see that the two cosine and sine terms are behaving in opposite di fashions and, and they change and they're not, uh, you know, they, they're going to switch around whether they're increasing, both decreasing, one increasing, one decreasing and so on. So there is no way that we could have, even if we just take, say, the first two terms, there is no solution to say we can't choose a value such that this cosine term here and is equal to this sine term here for any possible value of t that we choose to look at the system. We can fix it for a particular value of t by choosing the right values of a and phi, but we cannot fix it for any general value of time. So what this means is that all the cosine terms must cancel out uh, and satisfy an, an equality together, and the sine omega t terms must also separately satisfy a condition. And it's only if we separate these two things out and we require that the sine terms cancel and the cosine terms cancel that we can get an equation that will work for any possible value of time. So we can split this equation into a cosine uh, omega t equation. So we can collect all of those cosine terms and put them equal. And we can select all the sine omega t terms and require that they are equal. And that's the only way that this equation can work. So here are our two separate equations. We've got the cosine omega t equation on the top and the sine omega t equation on the bottom. And we're going to first look at the sine omega t equation. So the first thing is, is I can cancel through by the sine of omega t because that appears everywhere. The other term that appears in all of these uh, terms is a, so I can cancel through by a. And when I do that, what I'm going to be left with is I've now got a sine of phi times omega naught squared minus omega squared. And then I'm going to got minus 2 zeta omega naught omega times the cosine of phi, and that's equal to 0. Well, that's an easy equation to solve for phi here. Um, all I have to do is divide, uh, move this term over to this side of the equation and divide through by um, phi. And what I'm going to end up with is tangent of phi, because that's just sine divided by cosine. And that is going to be equal to 2 zeta omega naught times omega divided by omega naught squared minus omega squared. So I found a solution for this constant phi, which is the phase difference between the driving force and the response of the system. So now let's return to this top equation here, and I can cancel through by cosine omega t. But here I cannot cancel out the a's because, of course, I've got this uh, term um, here that comes from the driving force that doesn't depend on the amplitude of the system. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the a term out. So I'm going to have a, and then this is going to be um, multiply. Well, I'm also going to take a cosine phi out. So uh, a times the cosine of phi, and this is going to be multiplied by omega naught squared minus omega squared plus, and then 2 zeta uh, omega naught times omega. And then here I've got the sine of phi, but I've taken cosine phi out of the front. So this now becomes the tangent of phi. And this is equal to f naught over m. So now all I have to do, I know the tangent of phi, so I can ex substitute this value here, and I can put it in for tan phi here. And then I need to uh, find an i-trig identity for the cosine of phi. Well, in terms of the tangent of phi, well, it turns out that the cosine of phi squared is equal to 1 over 1 plus the tangent squared of phi. So I can use this to find a value for the cosine. But as you can imagine, the algebra here is going to get really horrendous. So I'm not going to go through the algebra in detail here. What we're going to do is I will show you the results that we get for both this amplitude and we've already got the value here for the phase difference phi. 
So here we have the results for the value of A. Um, it's a lot of nasty algebra, but it's just basic simple algebra which you can chug through uh, to get the answer. And so this gives us the amplitude of the system a long time after the driving force has been applied to it. Now phi here, if you remember, we had our displacement x of t was equal to a times the cosine of omega t minus phi. So a here was the amplitude of the system, and phi here is the phase difference. Remember, omega t is the phase of the driving force. So phi here, this is the phase difference between the system and the driving force. So this is a phase difference between the driving force and the response of the system. A here is an amplitude. And as you can see, the amplitude depends on both the natural frequency of the system and the driving frequency of the system, as well as the damping ratio here, zeta. So clearly, the response of the system, both in amplitude and in the phase, is going to depend on these three quantities. And this is what gives rise to many of the effects that we see from driven harmonic oscillators. So we've now got two expressions. One that gives us the amplitude of the system, that's the response to this periodic driving force. The other gives us the phase difference between the periodic driving force and the response of the system. Now what's curious about these solutions is they're perfect solutions. We don't have any unknown constants. And so you may be wondering, why have we not got constants of integration from solving these differential equations? Well, the one important caveat we applied when solving these uh, uh, equations was that we were looking for a solution that was a long period away from when we started applying the periodic driving force. And these constants of integration are hidden in what's called the transient solution to this driven harmonic oscillator. The other thing that we're not going to mention in this video, uh, other than to introduce the concept, and that is the effect of resonance. This is a result of the amplitude uh, expression that we derived, and what we see is that a particular frequency um, of driving force, we end up with a huge amplitude response of the system, and this effect that's called resonance is very important for engineers to understand when they're building structures because Structures sometimes have periodic driving forces applied to them, and if those periodic driving forces have the right frequency, sometimes the results can be catastrophic. So these are two important consequences that we'll discuss later.